thanks Barry and Asim uh, uh, for having me here. Uh, the topic that I want to talk about uh, is the ROO, one small step for measurement and one giant leap for PR, uh, uh, inspired by Neil Armstrong when he landed on the moon. Although we don't do any rocket science in PR and communications, it's absolute common sense. I'm going to tell you the story of Godridge, how by just taking one small course correction in terms of uh, you know, changing our measurement model and just moving one step forward, how it could actually reap us amazing results, a great mind from the management, most importantly, increase in budgets, and a great respect for the function, which is the brand and communication. So uh, well, the gun is on my head for completing in 19 minutes, so I'll just start immediately in terms of what I want to show you, just in terms of what we do uh, at Godridge for communications. A small uh, audio visual, but before that, uh, that's my group. Uh, we maintain mangroves nearly three the size of New York's Central Park. 23% uh, of the promoter holding it is in philanthropic trust, so I think it's giving back to the society. The rest of it, just Google Goldrich, I'll say one minute. And uh, let's have a small look at the communications function in terms of what we do. Can we have some volume, please? I bought the AV here. Um, it, it's going to be on the deck, so I'll just save some more time. Uh, this sounds very really sexy for the management because they understand uh, the excitement in the function and stuff. But the question we asked ourselves three years back was yet, are we really effective? What you just saw were the qualitative quantitative parameters which give you that instant gratification, but are they really impacting your final outcomes, the business results? Do you think these are enough for showcasing business results? Yes or no? No, absolutely no. How does one know that PR is really working? Can PR actions express a direct financial result when there are multiple constituencies involved? I was in sales when I started my career. I used to hate the marketing guys because I used to go and earn the business and the marketing guys used to come and say, we've done the campaign and you've got the order because of that. When I moved into marketing, I used to hate the PR guys because they used to say, we've sown the seeds of success for you. And I used to say, I have, so, so there was a siloism there. You know, uh, do you relate to that? When I moved into strategy, I used to look at the three people fighting. Now, in the corporate brand and communication side, I need to now live up to that same old story in terms of who owns the respect, who's won the order, who's got business. 
But that's not the end of PR gig that we do. Can one quantify the cost of reputation saved due to effective PR? So these are all intangible things, and, and that led us to ask ourselves the question, what should we do to gain that critical acclaim from the management so that the respect goes up, the budgets go up, and there is some kind of a uh, reason for us to do amazing stuff through PR. So we shifted gears, got our end objectives right, and we started using the qualitative and the quantitative parameters just to course correct the way in which we're progressing towards the final business outcomes. We consciously aligned PR communication objectives to the business goals. Three years back, we actually went to the CHRO, to the CFO, to all the functions, and asked them, what is it that you expect from us? I think that broke the silos, that created some kind of inclusivity. The sales and marketing guys said, we want product and service sales. We said, we'll give you awareness and perception. They wanted increase in market share. We'll say, we said, we'll give you brand preference. The HR head said, we want employee retention. There's attrition happening. We said, we'll create your employer brand. The finance team said, we want an increase in market cap, the P multiples. We said, okay, positive sentiment, image building. Direct connections, and these are all measurable. Do we talk about SOV now? Yes, we do, for that instant gratification. But the measurement is on the right hand side. And I'll give you examples how the needle has moved. We adopted a holistic measurement approach, which actually, I'm going to spend some time on this slide because this is the base for the entire success of PR at Goodrich. The first step was the input and planning, which we were doing very well. The video which you saw, brand exposure, that means I read, I'm the consumer, I read, and I get a measure internally as a PR person saying that we got great volume of news, we got a great quality of news, key message hit ratio was amazing, and we end our measurements there. Do you agree? In India, most of the organizations raise their hands during a session when I ask this question, because we end our measurements there. We never move to the next step. The second step was, we said, let's figure out the brand engagement, how the needle has moved. That's recall plus positive disposition. That means your TG says, okay, I connect with you, I feel for you. And that's where the real reputation journey begins. And what are the measures? Correlation with the brand scores, all are available. But we as PR people used to end it there. And that's why the big disconnect between the management and the PR teams. The communications outcome, I'll give you examples and the outcomes of that, the, the, the real proof of the pudding is about to come. And then, if you do this right, and the reputation is built, automatically the business outcomes come in. What are the business outcomes? The I did part of it. I saw, I felt for your brand, and I converted. So thought leadership, corporate reputation, increase in brand loyalty, increase in footfall, sales, preferred employer, higher stock price, all these are final outcomes, and that's where we want us to be measured on. The moment you start getting measured on those terms, the respect goes up automatically. And that was the outcome for us. Thought leadership today, Godridge and Asim would agree because he's the only one from India, and we got some more colleagues, but Godridge has a reputation which is amongst the top 10 most admired brands in the country. Preferred employer. Employer attention, uh, uh, attrition rate is less than 7%, an industry standard of 13 to 14%. Higher NPS, higher stock price, and I'm going to demonstrate some more slides on that. And most importantly, increase in the PR budgets because it was actually delivering value. Example of brand rankings, 14 businesses, 46 brands, 60% of the brands are amongst the top three. Most of the corporate brands and the larger brands in the FMCG sector are at least number one, two, three, or, and the proof of the pudding is right here. The brand rankings went up because of the brand PR, the integrated approach that we adopted. Stock performance, four of the companies are listed and one of them was listed six months back. 96 times oversubscribed. Where, where do you think the credit should be? For the retail investor, what is the decision making caveat? They look at the reputation. Who builds reputation? The communicators. The integrated system of creating that positive disposition has led to all these things. 43% CAGR vis-a-vis -vis Sensex which grows at 6%. 17% and here 29%. I mean, that's the growth which PR can actually affect. Employer brand, from the internal communication side, amazing results, great place to work, preferred employee, low attrition. These are the results which the top management is expecting you to give, rather than telling them the share of voice or maybe a positive tonality, blah, blah, blah. So if this is the story of Godridge, what are the seven lessons that I learned on my journey in the last three years? First, crisp objectives linked to business imperatives are a strong foundation. Rest is all noise. 
It's most important that you need your objectives right. And what's the process that we set? It's a very simple process. We look at the functional business in the group vision before setting our goals. The long range plan is referred to, media dipstick, national narratives, what's going to be conducive in a large nation like India, relevant communication trends. From all those points come out the strategic themes. From the strategic themes comes the uh, objectives and measures. From there comes the task, and from there comes the team structure and goal. So it's very easy for us to go and convince the management saying, this is what is required. This is the buy-in. This is coming from the businesses. And hence, that's the budget requirement. And of course, we have the group vision, which you just saw coming through in the past slides, which is about to foster an inspiring workplace, to have an innovative Indian brand, most trusted one read that. And of course, to create a shared value through Good and Green, which is our sustainability program. Second lesson, measures are easy to attach if one knows what success looks like. Classic example, if on the left-hand side is my annual operating plan, five critical pillars, these are the qualitative and quantitative measures that we use for course correction, but that's the linkage to the businesses. If we know exactly what we are hinting at, or are hitting at, and what we are moving towards, it becomes all the more easier for us to achieve it and measure it. Third, Track progress using qualitative and quantitative parameters. What does that mean? That's my monthly, monthly dashboard. We have it for 46 brands and 14 businesses all across every month, month on month coming in, in terms of the qualitative parameters, uh, number of articles, net impact. It's run like a sales function. There's something which drives proactiveness, creating more stories when business is as usual, when business is not as usual. How does it help? If you see the six communication messaging houses, if, if you see Goldridge Group at the last bar, if the index is four for sustainability, naturally the next one, the team starts hitting at more stories around sustainability. That's the proactiveness in PR which comes through if your insights and measurements are strong. If you're a national brand and if the coverage is 57% in uh, West and 4% in East, is it a good sign? It's a bad sign. Naturally what happens for the next one, the team starts focusing on East, so that the number of articles, the number of media engagements goes up significantly. That's the course correction I'm talking about. Number four and the most important part, which we realized a little late, is numbers orientation for the PR team is a must. I call the Martians, I call the boardroom folks the Martians and the communicators the Venetians. The Martians, their language is numbers, impact, Rossi, they talk about profitability, growth charts, they review results, and what do us communicators talk about? 50 media at the conference, three awards, four uh, headlines, fifth page, first page. I mean, that's a big disconnect between what the C-suite understood, understands and what we talk. And because of that disconnect, there's a lot of lack of respect and connect between the two factions. And you'll never get respect if you are not able to convince them in terms of what you're doing. So the C-suite understands comparative trends. So that's what we started doing it for the last three years. Showing them trends in terms of how the tonality has gone up, how the number of articles have gone. Very qualitative, quantitative, but presented in a way that the C-suite understands it. News management during business, not as usual. Increase in the news space, maximizing market visibility. Share of voice trends for the last three years. That's, that, that demonstrates that PR is actually working for them. The whole tonality in terms of the growth in positive tonality, the thought leadership contribution, on the social media side, which aspect, and this is all vis-a-vis -vis competition. So that there's a benchmark and there's a measure for that. And that is exactly what's working for us. Don't stop at the first step. Analyze outcomes. Classic example of analyzing outcomes, the brand reputation track scores. If you see, this is the last uh, uh, two quarters back, and Godridge was weak on innovation and investment value. This is in terms of what the media was perceiving us, or what people were reading about us was falling down. Automatically what happens is the team gets together, starts working on pushing the admiration drivers which were scored low. So this also helps, and these are all reputation scores vis-a-vis -vis large organizations within the country. The Tatas, Larson and Chiobro, Samson, Unilever, and that helps us course correct the direction even more and meet our final outcomes, which are the ones which we spoke at the beginning. Analysis basic stakeholders. I mean, I've just shown one stakeholder, which is media, because they're writing about you. And they need to know if the disposition for them, for us is high, they'll probably write better things for you. And that adds to the overall aura for the brand. How do you do the analysis of that? 
I mean, those scores vis-a-vis, -vis, again, competition. Number six, and the most important, do PR for PR. I mean, even my six-year-old daughter doesn't know what I do in office. When I go home, she asks me, what do you do, Dad? So uh, I, I can't explain PR. Can you explain PR to your kids? I don't know, serious question. I'm, I'm not able to explain it. When I was in marketing, I used to. When I was in sales, I could. If there's a finance person, he can. But can you? Can I hear a yes or a no? Yes? Well, let's connect our drinks. Let me understand what you do. Manage detractors. You're going to have a lot of detractors. We had a lot of detractors from the marketing side, from the finance side. Everyone gobbling up the credit because it's a combinational thing. But unless you prove that you've contributed significantly, you're not going to win through. Celebrate milestones. And seventh, invest in measurement tools. We never had measurement focus. But measurements today have helped us actually carve a niche for ourselves because we're able to go to the brands, tell them where they're lacking, what has been done by their competition, what needs to be done in terms of uh, increasing their share of voice, their disposition, all those things work. And that's what they're willing to listen. So I've done it in, you know, I've given you three and a half minutes. <laughs> so, so that's about my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, another company we will... There was a challenge from about. him. He was expecting that I'll over shoot it, overshoot it by five minutes. So. <laughs> um, so some interesting points there. Um, a company mo clearly moving very fast with very big growth ambitions. Uh, where's the first question coming from? Yes. Um, Thank you very much. I, uh, thank you for the great presentation, very motivating, um, um, and lots to process. Um, I was wondering about your correlation with the stock price, because uh, I find it very dangerous to do something like this. I mean, the stock price is based on future earnings, and it's something you don't really control. So um, can you make a statement towards that? How do you plan to manage that when stock prices go down and we're in a bear market or so? How will you then show what communication has done for, for the stock price? Absolutely, fantastic question. It's not a straight equation of saying that if you do a large number of PR articles and do more of PR, your stock price is going to go up. There are going to be a lot of aspects which work around, as, as you very rightly said. There's, but a predominant faction is the sentiment. In India, the retail investors who actually drive the whole stock market pricing, and we've mapped it in terms of every month tracking when the business was as usual, where there was no reaction, there were no announcements. Over a period of two years, we could track and we could find a correlation there saying that whenever there were no large announcements but proactive stories around three or four parameters which are the admiration drivers for the Goodrich Group, and we could do great stories around that, that was a the time there was a small spike in the share price. And that correlation is in progress right now, but a model is emerging in terms of how you can actually impact the stock price. You're absolutely right. It's a market condition. If rains don't come in India, the stock price goes down. But then there is an element of some contribution which goes because of the sentiment, because of the admiration, because of the reputation of an organization. The classic example, the point I was just trying to drive there was an IPO. When you launch an IPO, what goes into an IPO is why would people invest in you? Because of that faith, because of that admiration, because of that trust? Where does that come from? That comes from communication. And that's the direct correlation. Of course, once it is there, and if there are some market challenges, it might just fluctuate. But over a period of time, on a long-term basis, if you look at it, there is proof enough that when you do great stories around reputation, there is a spike. Okay. Did I, I answer your question? Our last question. Thank you. Thank you, Sujit Marion from Ogilvy. Hi, um, thank you for your passion and energy presenting it. Clearly, you uh, uh, would be a very good ambassador. The credit goes to him because there was a time. <laughs> No, I suspect you're equally passionate in the business. Uh, one measure that you and I touched on yesterday was employee engagement. I didn't see it in any of your models there. Are you tracking that and also looking at its impact on the business? Absolutely. And what measures do you look at there that we can learn from? So, so there Thank are plenty you. of measures in terms of employee engagement. I think, I think the employer brand uh, scores which you saw, which shot up in the last four years, have, been, have, been, uh, have gone up because of critical programs which were researched and launched within the organization to impact the employer brand. So one or two measures that we look at is the attrition part of it. 
it's an industry which is in our in our parallax 14 businesses which are not at the same maturity level some of them are the fmcg space some of them are manufacturing so the attrition rates are fluctuating at different places and the policies cannot be equivalent across so there's been a research done appropriate policies for those specific businesses were launched and there's a constant measure of employee engagement through various third party uh, solution providers which happen there is a complete study in terms of the 360 degree feedback which comes in again that as an internal communication tool because you get to know what's the kind of culture that's emerging there's a lot of values communication that happens there's a lot of culture communication that happens in terms of the whole thought with the final outcome being 10 times in 10 years so that's the common mantra within the organization each and every employee is passionate about reaching that goal and to do that if you back calculate there are four or five measures which come in attrition your employee engagement your 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 advocacy for uh, you know by recommending people so how many how many new jobs are sourced by internal rec uh, uh, employee recommendation it's it's on a rise and that showcases that the employees are the advocates of the organization we have facebook at work where all the communications internally happen through facebook at work and that's that's worked very well so i think to there's a long answer kind of maybe we could talk about okay. <laughs> during the drinks as marian said dynamic presentation thank you for being with us <laughs>